Praise the Lord. Brother J.P. Timmons here of Christ Church International. Hope you're having a blessed day. Here in America, it's President's Day, but due to the lack of us having a real president, we've decided not to celebrate it today, this year, or last year. Praise the Lord. You got to have a little humor. You know, I don't know about you, but uh, I'm not involved in politics, and I hate politics. I mean, to some extent, we're we're we all suffer from the from the uh, politics of our politicians, <laughs> governmental leaders, no matter what nation you're in. You know, I've seen it all over the world in the Philippines and Africa and Asia, Japan. And, uh, and here, especially, as I've said for many years. And it's just, uh, you know, the thing about, for example, a thief, people who steal, they, they just continue to steal more and more and more until, until they're not just caught, but punished. You know, it's punishment. And uh, if, they're, if, if not, they'll just continue to, to do that, and that's, what's happened here and it's been pretty well documented recently things I've said for 30 years about the corruption in the in the US government but it's a sad thing my brother and sister I've been praying for a number of these people that you know unless they repent they're going to die and go to hell and while it outrages us their actions outrage us they're stealing stealing billions of dollars from the American taxpayer but yet if they don't repent they're going to die and go to hell and that's our concern you know I'm not called to America I'm, I'm called to the church God gives me revelation about America and I'm going to be sharing some of that today but I'm not called to America I'm called to the church and to the church universal throughout the world <clears throat> but we need to pray for these people you know, I can give you some details about some people high up in our government that the Lord has spoken to me about, but I'm not at liberty to do that. But we need to we need to pray for these people. You know, it's it's a you know I say all the time, what does the word say? And and it's a horrible fact, my brother and sister. Jesus said more about hell than he did about heaven, and. Uh, you know, if you think about it, when you read the Bible, it just blows your mind because you know it's true. And I can tell you as a scientist and an engineer that there's more scientific proof to support the Bible than any piece of literature known to man. So you need to believe it. And Jesus said more about hell than he did about heaven. And, and uh, so, you know... It, there's only one penalty. We're all sinners saved by grace. Most people think that. Most people think that when you die, God puts your good deeds on a scale here and your bad deeds on a scale there. And if the good deeds outweigh the bad, then you go to heaven. And that's not the way it works. We're all sinners. We're all convicted. We all stand judged. And so, the point is, when you die, if you haven't received the sacrifice, the pardon for your sins through the blood of Jesus, then you'll go to hell. And most of these people are going to go to hell. You know, the murder and the drug running and all that stuff that's... When they get caught, they try to make it look like it's a one-off, but it's gone on for decades, and especially the murders. These people need to repent and get saved, praise God. And, you know, God tries to do that. There's a there's a revival going on, well, at least there was. I, I, I told Evelyn at the time that uh, they would probably kill it. And uh, it's this Asbury revival, and you can see here, I, I have the original journals. These were published back in the 50s. The journals and letters of Francis Asbury because I was raised in the Methodist church and my plan was to, I was, I was a Methodist lay preacher when I was 18. In the Methodist church, they don't ordain you until you finish seminary. So my plan was to go to SMU. And then um, 
won't go into long detail about why that didn't happen, but basically I went over among the Baptists that my grandparents were. And, but fact is, Francis Asbury was a, was a tremendous man of God, and he came to America, and he, he was a circuit rider, and he rode you know, hundreds of thousands of miles, and uh, his journals are very interesting to read because of, of the time. But what's happening up there? You know, God orchestrates it, but people kill it. And I knew it would happen. And, you know, when these things happen, people, there's always the, the self-proclaimed uh, leaders of the church who, who have to say, well, I'm going to go check this. I'm, I'm gonna, I'll be sure and give you my stamp of approval whether this is genuine. You know, they did that with Todd Bentley in Florida years ago and different ones. Just so much foolishness. Uh, people who claim to be leaders and you know you, you don't have to talk to anybody to see that that what was going on there was real but but I heard a woman said yes to one of the staff it wasn't the president but she said well you know we, we've got to we got to organize this basically so that we can get the students quote she she quote she said back to normal back to normal yeah right Reminded me of uh, Evelyn was ministering in a church some years ago, and <clears throat> pastor got up and interrupted worship, and he said, "Well, he said this is an unbelievable." He said, "I hate to interrupt what the Holy Ghost is doing, but we have to get on with the service." And so that's what they're doing up there. They want to get back to normal, and God will let them get back to normal. And all that comes back to I want to read a. Revelation, uh, this is from my book, Revelations from God, Volume 2. You know, I have two volumes. I, I could publish some more volumes. I haven't gotten back to them, but this goes through the early 2000s from my journals. But this is sort of what goes on, my brother and sister. It's a, this, this revelation came on April the 2nd of 2000 in Penticton, British Columbia, where we were actually living at the time. We had a house there. and It's a revelation on spiritual inbreeding. This morning as I was attending a men's prayer breakfast, now this is the largest Pentecostal church, or the oldest Pentecostal church in British Columbia. I mean, it was over 100 years old. I was attending a men's prayer breakfast there, and I knew a lot of these men. The Lord gave me a vision of a white door closing, and he said that my ministry at this church has closed. While Ev and I were discussing this later, we both heard the same words, same words in the spirit, spiritual inbreeding, spiritual inbreeding. I'd never heard these words before, but their meaning is obvious. Some churches and ministries, in fact many, develop spiritual inbreeding because they always have the same people ministering. And normally they're all birds of the same feather. For example, faith faith teachers. You know, whenever Copeland, Kenneth Copeland has a convention, he has Jerry Savelle. And, I mean, you know, and I'm not saying they're not men of God, but... They're all faith. They're all faith teachers. And so this can make it difficult for the Lord to reveal new concepts and thoughts. You know, you see this in corporations. I've done consulting in corporations, large and small, and you see this a lot in corporations. People who come up from the inside uh, usually don't make very many changes. And so sometimes you need to get someone from the outside with a different perspective and a different background, perhaps. So they're normally all birds of the same feather, and this can make it difficult for the Lord to reveal new concepts and thoughts. This problem, in turn, can lead to Christians not becoming well-rounded and well-grounded in the Word. Praise the Lord. And, and we see a lot of that today, and that's sort of what's going on up there. You know, they got to uh, organize, and you know, students need to get back to business as usual which means without the holy spirit so you know whenever whenever we organize things we tend to organize the holy spirit right out of the picture and and 
he'll let us. You know, he wants to do things, but we don't we don't want to allow him to. It's a shame. Well, our website's www.ccipublishing.net. I'm Brother J.P. Timmons, and I want to bring you a message today that's been on my heart for over a week. I was going to bring it on on the Sabbath, this last past Sabbath, but my notes got disappeared from the computer. I haven't had that happen in a long time, but I spent about an hour and a half composing notes, and the Spirit of the Lord was on me that day all morning, and then, boom, they magically disappeared. Even the autosave didn't work. And we all know what causes those kind of things to happen. So if you want to open your Bibles, you can open them to Joshua chapter 23. And I'm going to speak to you today on truth, justice, and the American way. Truth, justice, and the American way. Praise the Lord. Joshua 23, this is Joshua's farewell address. Now it came about after many days when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their enemies on every side, and Joshua was old, advanced in years, that Joshua called for all Israel, for their elders and their heads and their judges and their officers, and said to them, I am old, advanced in years. Now why did he do this? You know, when you're reading the scriptures, we're going to do a little expository teaching here along the way, but. When you're reading the scriptures, like I say, you need to, to determine what, not just what's going on physically, anyone can see that, but what's going on spiritually. And uh, you learn things, you know, what gifts of the Spirit are in operation, if any, and, and those type of, that helps you develop the eye of the eagle. And you have seen all that your Lord your God has done to all these nations because of you, for the Lord your God is he who has been fighting for you. See, I have apportioned to you these nations which remain as an inheritance for your tribes. With all the nations which I have cut off from the Jordan even to the great sea toward the setting of the sun, the Lord your God, he will thrust them out from before you <coughs> and drive them from before you and you will possess their land just as the Lord your God promised you. Be very firm then to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses so that you may not turn aside from it to the right or to the left. What does that mean? It means you got to be a doer of the word as, as the New Testament tells us. Don't turn to the left or the right. Be a doer of the word so that you will not associate with these nations, these which remain among you or mention the name of their gods or make anyone swear by them or serve them or bow down to them. But you are to cling to the Lord your God as you have done to this day. For the Lord has driven out great and strong nations from before you. And as for you, no man has stood before you to this day. Wow, isn't that something? God fights our battles for us. One of your men puts to flight a thousand. For the Lord your God is he who fights for you, just as he promised you. So take diligent heed to yourselves to love the Lord your God. For if you ever go back and cling to the rest of these nations, these which remain among you and intermarry with them so that you associate with them and they with you, know with certainty that the Lord your God will not continue to drive these nations out from before you, but they will be a snare and a trap to you and a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God has given you. And isn't that exactly what happened? Now behold, today I am going the way of all the earth. In other words, Joshua was saying, I'm going to die. And you know in all your hearts, you hear me say this all the time, it's so incredible. Here's Joshua, you know, he lived 110 years. He saw the works of the Lord. He saw, and here's his testimony. You know in all your hearts and all your souls that not one word, not one word of all the good words which the Lord your God spoke concerning you has failed. All have been fulfilled for you. Not one of them has failed. Praise the Lord. That's why I say all the time, what does the word say? Because, you know, Jesus himself said, hey, the scriptures cannot be broken. Pharisees had a problem. They didn't seem to understand that. The scriptures cannot be broken. 
I watch over my word to perform it, Jeremiah 112. You say that all the time, and we've seen it in our own lives. He watches over his word to perform it. Not one good word has failed. All have been fulfilled. And it shall come about that just as all the good words which the Lord your God spoke to you have come upon you, so the Lord will bring upon you all the threats until he has destroyed you from off this good land which the Lord your God has given you. What's that? That's a warning. That's a warning to follow the word. When you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them. Then the anger of the Lord will burn against you and you will perish quickly from off the good land which he has given you. So that's a warning, isn't it? Not to depart from the Lord. You know, Elijah said on Mount Carmel, why do you halt between two pigeons? If Jehovah's God, serve him. But if Baal, serve him. And many Christians today live with that dichotomy they, they they vacillate one day they're serving Baal the next day they're trying to serve Jehovah and you can't do that you know Jesus himself said that that you can't serve God and mammon and mammon is a picture of Baal the the kingdom of Baal the the dark kingdom of Satan money's one of the things and materialism is one of the things he uses to keep people from the Lord now, chapter 24, we're going to read verses 1 through 15. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and their judges and their officers. And they presented themselves before who? God. Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord. Now, what's going on there? What spiritual gift? Prophecy. Prophecy. He's prophesying. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, from ancient times your fathers lived beyond the river. God's given them a history lesson. Your fathers lived beyond the river, namely Terah, the father of Abraham. He's going clear back and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. Abraham, then the fathers were serving, the fathers were serving other gods. Then I took your father, Abraham. What's that? That's the principle of election. Then I took your father, Abraham, from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. To Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau, and to Esau I gave Mount Seir to possess it. But Jacob and his sons went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt by what I did in its midst. And afterward I brought you out. I brought your fathers out of Egypt. And you came to the sea, and Egypt pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. But when they cried out to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your own eyes saw what I did in Egypt. And you lived in the wilderness for a long time. Then I brought you into the land of the Amorites who lived beyond the Jordan and they fought with you and I gave them into your hand and you took possession of their land when I destroyed them before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and fought against Israel. And he sent and summoned Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. You hear me talk about the Balaam boys. Well, here's a rehearsal of Balaam. You know, he was a false prophet. But I was not willing to listen to Balaam, so he had to bless you. And I delivered you from his hand. Now, there's a principle there. God wants to deliver you from the hand of these Balaam boys. You know, don't give finances to these people who get up and beg and, and tell you lies and things. It's not of God. They're Balaam boys. But I was not willing to listen to him, so he had to bless you. You crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho, and the citizens of Jericho fought against you. 
and the Amorite, and the Perizzite, and the Canaanite, and the Hittite, and the Girgashite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Thus I gave them into your hand. Then I sent the hornet before you, and it drove out the two kings of the Amorites from before you, but not by your sword or your bow. Again, God fights our battles for us. If we'll stand in faith and we'll live holy, righteous lives. I gave you a land on which you had not labored and cities which you had not built and you have lived in them. You are eating of vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. God provides, Jehovah Jireh, amen. It's another principle of scripture. Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. Just that same principle we see with Elijah later. This is Joshua. You've all heard this quote. We have a door doorman at our house said, you know, choose this day whom you'll serve. But it's for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen. Haven't we all heard that? It's a principle. Choose this day whom you'll serve. Hopefully you'll choose Jehovah Jireh. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, Jesus said, I say it all the time, Jesus said in Matthew 4, 4 and Luke 4, 4, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so I believe those are the two most, I mean, they're really the same scripture the same saying but i believe that those are the most that's the most important thing jesus ever said because we can't live without this word this word's much more important to you than the physical food that you partake of every day man does not live by bread alone in fact you know i've shared uh, my my visitation with satan i shared my first visitation which happened back in 19 i believe it was 85 it might have been 83 it was i haven't gone back and looked but it was before i went to africa i was taken into by the holy spirit i was taken into satan's office down in hell and i sat across the desk from him and and he was very arrogant and threatened me and a lot of things and, and i stood up and, and pointed my finger at him and i and, and leaned across his desk and I said, you're going to have to prove to me that the word of God doesn't work. And I've come to realize over the years, you know, God gives us personal prophecies just like he did Abraham and others in the scriptures, Jacob and David concerning his house. And so God gives us personal prophecies, but very often we focus on those and we don't, we don't see that, you know, this is, this is what God's really using us to, using our lives to impact others. And I've come to realize from that visitation that it's exactly that. It's what I say all the time on here. You know, what does the word say? To tell you without, without any apology, tell you the truth that the word of God works. The word of God, the scriptures cannot be broken. We've seen it over and over and over and over and over. You stand in faith. Your part is to stand in faith and believe the word. It's Jesus' responsibility to watch over his word to perform it. And then I've learned a couple of other things that I've shared with, shared with our church in Libby and I've shared with other churches. And that is, you don't tell God how to do it. See, a lot of times we're like Naaman the Syrian, you know. Naaman goes down and he... he yeah, oh man, it's, it's just awesome. Second Kings 5, what you can learn from that one chapter. You know, he went down to receive healing for his leprosy and uh, Elisha didn't even go to meet him. He had an entourage and all this money. And, you know, he was like number two guy in the nation and, and you know, be like the President of the United States, if we had one, <laughs> came to visit me. And I'm not even here, you know, I, I send a, I send a messenger to him, you know, it, it, it offended, it offended him. He had, he had some pride issues, didn't he? And so 
he he had his own idea. You see, you can you cannot receive from God because you're trying to tell him how to do it. Go back and read what uh, Naaman said. He said, "Behold, I thought, I thought this is how I thought it was going to happen. The prophet would come out and wave his hands, and 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 the the leprosy would leave. You know, that's how I thought it was going to happen. We don't tell God how to do it, and we don't tell him." when to do it very often it's you know we went through a we went through a two year maybe three maybe closer to three year trial in our own family here where Evelyn, Evelyn almost died and it hadn't been for prayers and confessing the word and you know by us and by others and standing in faith so you know I mean it does it you don't tell God when to do it. It might be right at the end. You know, I've heard testimonies. I heard testimony of a woman who had breast cancer. I mean, she would wake up in a pool of blood in her bed, but she stood on the word. And and I think she was a pastor's wife. And then, you know, God healed her at the, like, 11.59 p.m. You know, sometimes God does, doesn't show up, but he's always on time. And so... We don't tell God how to do it, and we don't tell him when to do it. We stand in faith, and we believe the word, and we ask ourselves on any situation, what does the word say, right? A man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So we've kind of, I've kind of learned that that uh, one of the greatest ministries the Lord has for me is to point people to the truth, which is the word of God, that we are to live by and count much more precious this word than physical bread. And so people say, you know, I've had people say to me, I, you know, I was going to do this, but I kept hearing you, you say, what does the word say? What? And, and it affected their life, you know, and that's how God uses us to bless other people and to uh, affect other people and to bring other people into the ministries and things. And, and, you know, he uses, he uses us, he uses us as vessels and, uh, and we, and we, it's our responsibility to live in holiness and righteousness and fear of the Lord and to, to make our vessels pure so that the spirit can flow through us with greater power <clears throat> and, and then God will use us, you know. He uses us to prophesy over people and cast out demons and heal the sick and raise the dead. You know, my wife and I have done all of those things and more. And it's because, you know, we've allowed the Holy Spirit to move through us. and We haven't tried to control him. We've allowed him to do what he wants to do. Praise the Lord. So the word is the most important thing and it's important for you to be in the Word, meditating in the Word, storing up the Word within you. Praise God. Truth, justice, and the American way was originally the slogan for Superman. If you're <laughs> as old as I am or close, you probably remember that. When Superman came out in the 50s, um, when it was, I think it was about early 50s, They'd have a picture. He was standing. They only had black and white TV. And he'd be standing there with an American flag behind him waving. And truth, justice, and the American way was originally the slogan for Superman. But guess what? And I found this out kind of by accident. They recently changed it. They changed it to truth, justice. Truth, justice is still there, but a better tomorrow. How globalist is that? How elite is that? How woke is that? Presumably, they changed it because since the days of Obama, America has been considered evil by our rulers. You know, I don't know why they changed it, but I'm, I believe that's probably a, a good reason. So let's look at that slogan. First is the word truth. You know, quid est veritas. Quid est veritas is Latin. That's what Pilate said to Jesus. That's the question Pilate asked Jesus almost 2,000 years ago. Quid est veritas, which means in Latin, what is truth? What is truth? See, truth's become perverted, and we see that in Isaiah, and you hear me say all the time, and this, 
and you're going to see it more here. I'm not going to go through all the scriptures, but I have, I have probably 50 scriptures. But America is very similar, and we're following the same path as Judah of, of the Old Testament. And so you can learn a lot about this nation by looking at, and you can learn a lot about the church by looking at Israel. But Judah as a nation is uh, very much like what we're seeing in, in America where truth becomes perverted. Truth and, and what used to be evil is now good and what used to be good is now evil. We're going to read a couple of scriptures later. Not all of them, but... So that's the question Pilate asked Jesus. And we know that 3 John 4, for example, the apostle John said... You know, beloved, I, I, I'm finding it very much a joy that, that my people are walking in truth. And so we need to walk in the truth. We need to understand the truth. And, and uh, let's go over to John chapter 1. I know you're all familiar with this uh, scripture. John chapter 1, Jesus said, or the Word says, John chapter 1, verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. So you see, one of the reasons Jesus came was to model truth for us. He was truth in a physical body. He was truth in the form of a man. If you watched Jesus, if you walked with Jesus, if you had the eye of the eagle, you would watch him and what he did, you'd say, this is truth. This is truth. He was full of grace and truth. And then verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ, truth, very important. And one of the reasons Jesus, we see his life, we see that he modeled truth in his life because he was always confronting error, always confronting error. And even in their thought life, you know, one of the most amazing things Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount he said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Gosh, think how much, if people took that in, how much that must have shocked them. I mean, these are our religious leaders. They're, they're you know, and they consider themselves the creme de la creme. Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds theirs, you'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow, that's some truth, isn't it? I better, I better meditate on that. I better try to get the eye of the eagle and determine what that means because that is heavy. That is heavy. Jesus confronted error. That was an error in people's thinking. Well, these, you know, if I could just maybe be half as good as a Pharisee, I'll, I'll, no, Jesus said your righteousness has to exceed theirs. And he confronted the Pharisees time and time again. We see it. They were, they were, their thinking was wrong about the Sabbath, about many other things. You know, if the Pharisees hadn't been so dumb, not all of them, I mean, you know, we see in John chapter 3 where some of them came to the Lord and uh, Nicodemus, but they should have understood, you know, all these things keep, this healings, and how come they're always, how come they're always on the Sabbath? Maybe I better pray into this. 
Maybe there's a principle God's trying to show me because I'm a little spiritually dense. So he always confronted error. Jesus even said to them one time, you don't understand the scriptures or the power of God. Amen. And he even said to Nicodemus, Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin, the very highest, the very elites of the religious system, the Sanhedrin. Jesus said to him, you're a teacher of Israel? You're a teacher and you don't understand these things? Wow, what an indictment. In a kind way, but what an indictment. If I'm going to teach you something, then I better know something. You can't learn nothing from somebody that don't know nothing. It's part of the problem in the church. You got people giving, as Jimmy Swaggart said years ago, book reports. They're giving you a book report on some book they read. Well, that's not from the Spirit of the Lord. So you have to understand the Scriptures and the power of the Scriptures and and the Word of the Lord and and how and and the Holy Spirit and how they work together to bring wisdom and truth. Praise the Lord. Now let's look at John chapter 8, and you hear me quote this all the time because I had to learn this myself from the scriptures because you see it all the time. I saw it when I ministered in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania years ago in the, the Capitol Rotunda. The very top is a stained glass window quoting John eight thirty two, and you sh- and you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's what you hear all the time. People say, well, you know, the word says that you'll know the truth. The truth will set you free. No, that's not what it says at all. It doesn't say that. We're going to read it right here. You got to go back to 31. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if, what's that? That's conditional. This is a conditional statement. If you continue in my word. What does that mean, continue in the Word? That means you study and meditate the Word. If you continue in my Word, then you are truly disciples of mine. What is that? It means if you don't continue in the Word, you're not a disciple of Jesus. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. You see, it's continuing in the Word. It's studying the Word. It's meditating in the Word. The Holy Spirit's shown me so many errors, you know, in what people think and how we, and what we're taught. Because when you continue in the Word, you will know the truth, and it will set you free. It will rearrange your theology, and we, that's what we try to do on here. We try to rearrange people's theology so that it lines up with the Word of God. Praise the Lord. So. That's why it's important to know the truth. Amen? Now let's look at John 14, 6. Praise the Lord. John is an incredible gospel. You know, it's so much different than the other three. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth. And the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And of course you all know that scripture. And you've heard it many times. I am. That's one of the great seven. The seven I am's of John. Jesus says I am the way. The way to the Father. I am the truth. What we shared. And we're talking about now. The truth. And the life. That's Zoe or eternal life. I am the eternal life. Now in verse 17, he's talking about the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. And of course he was referring to after the resurrection when he sent the Holy Spirit. But notice that it says the world can't have the Spirit because you only receive the Spirit when you're born again and you accept Christ as the Savior for your sins and your Lord and Master. Then the Holy Spirit comes and indwells you. 
the world cannot receive him. That's why, you know, God gave me that that uh, equation for true wisdom years ago. I wrote it, Mysterious Secrets, and a couple of other books, I think. But true wisdom equals true knowledge plus true understanding. And so true knowledge is the word. True understanding of the word comes by the spirit. Like I shared with Philip in the Ethiopian. He was reading the word, but he didn't understand it. You have to get it by the spirit. So no one in the world can have true wisdom. They can have worldly wisdom, but that's not true wisdom. That's not the highest form of wisdom because you can only have the highest form of wisdom if you're possessed by the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. And I know most people watching this understand that concept. Now let's go back to Zechariah chapter 9. Zechariah chapter 9, we're going to learn something about truth. Don't forget what we're talking about, truth, justice, and the American way. Zechariah chapter 9, I mean chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. For thus says the Lord of hosts, just as I purposed to do harm to you when your fathers provoked me to wrath, says the Lord of hosts, and I have not relented. So I have again purposed in these these days. Now what days he's talking about? Well, this is Zechariah. Who was, who was Zechariah? Zechariah was a prophet. He was a seer. He had many visions. Who was he a prophet to? He was a prophet to Judah and the restoration of the city of Jerusalem, amen, the walls and the temple during the time of Zerubbabel, amen. So in these days, that's what he's speaking about, those days when the nation is being restored. So God's saying, don't forget, I purposed harm to you back when you were rebelling against me, but now I have not, uh, but now I'm going to do good to Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Do not fear. In other words, I'm restoring you. Remember those four four R's, I call them. You see it in the book of Judges. Rebellion. Retribution, judgment. Repentance, restoration. When we repent, God restores us. These are the things which you should do. Speak the truth to one another. They weren't doing that. They were lying to each other. Judge with truth and judgment for peace in your gates. Also let none of you devise evil in your heart against another and do not love perjury. Oh boy, how the perjury is loved in this nation. You see person after person go before Congress. They just lie their teeth out. Nothing ever happens to them. So they don't fear perjury. They don't fear going to prison. For all these are what I hate, declares the Lord. God hates lying. He hates perjury, which is lying. He hates it. He hates it. And let's not forget Ephesians 6.14, where we learn as Christians that part of the full armor of God is the, quote, belt of truth. Right? Right? You have to have the belt of truth on. The word of the Lord says in Proverbs, I believe it's the 23rd chapter, buy the truth and don't sell it. You know, pursue the truth. Be honest. And in Revelation 21, 8, the word of the Lord says that all liars will have their place in the lake of fire. So if you're a habitual liar, then you, then you need deliverance if you're a Christian or, and, and <clears throat> you need to not lie anymore or you'll have your place in the lake of fire. So well, I believe in Jesus. No, if you lie all the time, you don't. The word of the Lord says in 1 John that no lie is of the truth. We're talking about the truth. 
When you lie, who's that? That's Satan. Who's the father of lies? Satan. Jesus told the Pharisees, you're of your father the devil. He's a liar. He's a murderer. He's a thief. No lies of the truth. Be truthful. That's what they're being told to do here. And then we see in 1 Kings 2 and 4, let's go there real quickly. Um, we see God's requirements for um, rulers. 2-4, 1 Kings 2-4. And this, of course, is when Solomon was made king. And so he told Solomon, the Lord says, The Lord may carry out his promise which he spoke concerning me, saying, Quote, if your sons are careful of their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart, with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Of course, that was promised to David. That his sons had to walk in the truth. Amen. It's important to God. And in 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 9 through 12, we see... You know, you all remember this, how Solomon prayed for wisdom instead of wealth and things. But God says, give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? And it was pleasing in the sight of the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. God said to him, because you've asked this thing and have not asked for yourself long life, nor riches, nor for the life of your enemies, but it asks for your self-discernment to understand justice. Justice. Behold, I have done according to what you've asked. And I've given you a wise and discerning heart so that there's been no one like you before you, nor shall one like you arise after you. Amen. So these all demonstrate God's requirement of rulers that they be truthful. And then, and this one also applies to justice. So now let's go back to Deuteronomy 16, and we're going to talk about justice. Deuteronomy 16, verses 19 and 20. You shall not distort justice. You shall not be partial, and you shall not take a bribe. Boy, our leaders need to read that. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and perverts the words of the righteous. Justice and only justice you shall pursue that you may live and possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you. That's a pretty powerful reason to pursue justice. What are we talking about? Truth, justice, and the American way. Praise the Lord. And you all know Amos 5.24, which says, Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness as an ever-flowing stream. Justice, justice, justice. Praise the Lord. Now, we're going to read Jeremiah, one, Jeremiah 5. Verses 1 through 9. This, this is very reminiscent of Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, what the Lord said to Abraham. Hey, if you can find, you know, he got down to 10. First it was, you know, 50. Well, if you get down to 10, righteous people, I'll spare the city. But this is Jerusalem, or in our case, it's Washington, D.C., Roam to and fro through the streets of Washington, D.C., and look now and take note, and seek in their open squares. If you can find a man, if there is one who does justice, who seeks truth, then I will pardon her. And although they say, as the Lord lives, surely they swear falsely. 
O Lord, do not turn your eyes. O Lord, do not your eyes look for truth. You have smitten them, but they did not weaken. You have consumed them, but they refused to take correction. You know, God generally is very gentle initially with his judgments, but then they get more and more harsh when we refuse to repent. They have made their faces harder than rock. They have refused to repent. And we as a nation have refused to repent. Then I said, they are only the poor. They are foolish. They do not know the way of the Lord or the ordinance of their God. In other words, the common people. And uh, that's not true here. Most of, the, most of our common people uh, do know the truth and they do know the injustice and everything that's going on in government. I will go to the great and will speak to them for they know the way of the Lord and the ordinance of their God. But they too with one accord have broken the yoke and burst the bonds. Therefore a lion from the forest will slay them. A wolf of the deserts will destroy them. A leopard is watching their cities. Everyone who goes out of them will be torn in pieces because their transgressions are many. Their apostasies are numerous. Why should I pardon you? Your sons have forsaken me and sworn by those who are not gods. When I had fed them to the full, they committed adultery and trooped to the harlot's house. They were well-fed, lusty horses, each one neighing after his neighbor's wife. Shall I not punish these people, declares the Lord? And on a nation such as this, shall I not avenge myself? God has to. He has to. You know, Billy Graham said many years ago, God doesn't judge America. He has to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. And this nation's been under judgment for many years, despite what you've heard the pillow prophets say. That's a term that David Wilkerson coined that I use sometimes. Pillow prophet. <laughs> Psalm 24, verses 3 through 6. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? You know, I tell people, I, I got a call one night from a pastor in Puerto Rico. I mean, it was late at night, too. He was telling me about a certain ministry you would all know. And they had a they had a fifteen hundred dollar prophecy line, they had a thousand dollar, a five hundred, a hundred, and a twenty. You could get in any line, get your prophecy, according to how much you're willing to pay. Why would anybody are people that stupid that they would pay money to listen, listen to it here. Who may ascend? Who's going, to, who's going to be in the Lord's presence? Who may ascend? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood. Let me tell you those things, they're lying to you, these Balaam boys. And has not sworn deceitfully, he shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob. And so that's why we talk about the Jacob generation is the generation that's seeking the face of the Lord and not his hand, not, not all this money and materialism. I want to know. I want to know the Lord. I want to walk with the Lord. I want to see him in his glory. You know, I have a prophecy. The Lord said, I'm going to appear to you in my glory. Well, that hadn't happened yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Because, you know, all these other things, they're going to burn. They're going to burn. They're going to go away. All you have is what you can do for the Lord today. Spiritual blessings and, and blessing him by, by seeking truth and justice. And... You know, I've read before on here the vision I had of the Supreme Court back in early 2000 when, when uh, Chief Justice Roberts was being confirmed and Alito, actually Alito went into, was before when George W. Bush had appointed these and, and I could say a lot about that, but I had this vision where 
I was standing on the steps of the Supreme Court and the door just burst open. And it's in my book, Revelations from God, but the door just burst open and this huge like waterfall of red blood came out and just came down and just boom and just was flowing out of the doors of the Supreme Court. And I knew in my spirit that that vision didn't have to do with Roe v. Wade and, and the aborted the, the abortion problem, even though that was the greatest sin of America at that time. But I knew it had to do with justice. That, you know, there's a statue right there in the Supreme Court of Lady Justice, and she's blind. That's Justice is supposed to be, you know, equivalent for everyone. If you break the law, no matter how much money, you don't, you don't buy your way out. You don't bribe your way out. Justice is supposed to be blind, but it's not blind. And we've seen so much of that here in America, especially recently. There's favoritism, and justice is not blind. So there's no justice coming. There's no justice in the land. And that was the point of that vision. And then I wanted to read this from, this is Revelations from God, Volume 2, which I was reading out of earlier. But this, this is a revelation on the destruction of America. And I actually have this in here. I have it, I think, a couple of times. This was in Penticton, British Columbia on December 29th of 1999. While praying early this morning, I heard the Spirit of God say regarding America, quote, you are witnessing the destruction of a nation, close quote. Now listen carefully to this, what he was showing me. People, even most of the church, do not understand that our actions and behavior can trigger a response in the realm of the Spirit. But because God is long-suffering and patient, we do not associate eventual judgment with prior deeds and actions. We don't. And that's like, you know, God showed me back in the 80s when all these shootings, and, they, and they've gotten worse today. But back then, some a guy went in, the, I think he was a teenager, went into the Irving Mall in Texas and just walked up to people and shot them in the head. And the Lord showed me, and that's what this is speaking about, that, that the spirit of murder had been loosed in America because of abortion. So when you allow certain laws or you pass certain laws or you do certain things, you know, that, that make God angry, then you, you trigger a response in the realm of the spirit. Even though you may think you're doing the right thing like Jehoshaphat did, going to battle with Ahab, it almost cost him his life because he made God his enemy. And we need to be careful about that. The destruction of a nation Praise the Lord. So truth, justice, and the American way. As I said before, I'm not called to America, but rather the church, universal. But I've received revelation, and in fact, I was taken to heaven one time. You can go back and read it. Go back, to, go on our website, www.ccipublishing.net. You can go under the archive teaching articles back to January the 10th of 2010 you know i usually pray over i usually pray quite a bit toward the end of the year and the first of the year and god gave me america's last call to repentance i've seen the end of america in visions twice a nuclear holocaust back in april 1985 i saw america on a chart headed swiftly down I asked the Lord why this was happening, and he spoke the following, which explains it perfectly. He said, a nation is like a person. The more it opens itself up to the devil, the more he comes in and occupies. And he said, the two greatest, he meant most numerous, spirits in operation in the earth today are deceiving spirits and religious spirits. See, if you open yourself up, the devil will come in. I mean, sometimes those spirits are bold. I was I was sitting in a in a 
hotel room in Penticton, British Columbia. I was sitting looking out at the lake back in 99, and the spirit of adultery came in the room and talked to me and said, I want to enter you. And then normally when you see a spirit like that, it's in a person. You can sense it in that person, or it might sometimes speaks to you from that person. This time it just came in. It was bold. And it's the righteous who are supposed to be bold as a lion. Amen. Praise the Lord. So a nation is like a person. You know, if you open yourself up, if you start lying, cheating, stealing, then the devil comes in. And those spirits occupy, that's like a beachhead. They bring other spirits with them. Next thing you know, Mark Bundy, who killed all those women, he got his start just watching pornography. But that polluted him. And then these other spirits came in. Pretty soon he was killing. He was killing young women. Praise the Lord. that He got saved before he died in the electric chair. But So we see that the nation, when the nation opens itself up through, you know, through allowing, uh, I mean, it, you know, for example, when I ministered at a church, it was an Afri African church in Dallas some years ago, and they, they built a big mosque up the street. And I said, I said, the next time you invite me back, I said, I, I don't expect to see that mosque up there. In other words, you're supposed to pray it out. It, it pollutes the land. When you allow a mosque to be built in your town, it pollutes the land and it brings death and destruction to people. You need to pray it out. You need to bind it up, get rid of it. You have that authority. All authority is given to you by the Lord Jesus. He expects you to do something about it. It's a blight on the land. It brings sin and evil. And you just keep allowing all of that. You know, we've got all these mosques and, and Hindu temples and all this stuff. Uh, it, it pollutes the land. And you allow more and more demons in. And eventually, they take over your country. Eventually, the nation falls like America's doing now. We see it. We see it every day. You see it every day. It's unfortunate. You have to live through the things you prophesy. So a nation is like a person. The more they open themselves up to the devil, the more he comes in and occupies. And you probably never heard this from anyone, but I believe I have this from the Lord regarding why America was birthed. First of all, you have to realize that the nation was birthed through prayer, much prayer. And it's for three reasons. Number one, to be a beacon of light, truth, and hope in a dark, sin-sick, crying, dying world. And God, listen to this, this is a revelation. God caused the French people to give us the Statue of Liberty as a sign for that purpose a sign that we've lost sight of as a nation, you know. We focused on allowing people to come here for liberty, but the nation no longer is the torch of God's light that draws them. Instead of being a beacon of light, we are now darkness and a nation under God's judgment, just like Israel during Isaiah's time. And here's some scriptures for you. Psalm 43, 3, Isaiah 1, verses 1 and 2, Isaiah 10, verses 1 through 3, Jeremiah 5, 1 through 9, which we read earlier, Jeremiah 7, 28, Jeremiah 9, 1 through 9. Well, number two, America was raised up to protect God's covenant people, Israel. Revelation twelve fourteen. He raised America up to protect Israel and certain people, especially if they're Muslim sympathizers in, in our government, they don't want to see that. So they're fighting against God's stated reason for developing or for birthing the nation. 
Number two, to protect Israel. Number three, America was birthed to restrain evil men and evil nations in the world and to be a standard of justice for all the world to see. But there's no longer any justice in America. Christians are viewed as domestic terrorists because they don't agree with the current zeitgeist. And if you don't know what that word means, you need to look it up. I wrote a teaching article years ago about zeitgeist, God's, God's zeitgeist. And I put confer 2 Thessalonians 2.7. And this has occurred for exactly the reason that the Lord showed me in that vision back in April 1985. We've opened ourselves up to the devil and he's come in like a flood to destroy the nation. In October 1991, the Lord spoke to me during a time of worship and said, quote, There are more people in America today in need of deliverance than there are in need of healing. That's a sign right there. When more people need deliverance, that means the devil's really come in. Amen? And I read a statistic, I think it was two days ago, about 61% of teenage girls in America now are, are extremely depressed, and 30% have thoughts of suicide, demon activity. Suicide's a spirit, my brother and sister. You can just believe me, it's a spirit. I've, I've felt it come in rooms, houses where I was. Spirit of suicide. It's a spirit. If it ever tries to come on you, you, you resist it in the name of Jesus. You cast it away. Depression's the same thing. It's a, it's a low-level devil. I can lay my hands on you and, man, that, that spirit will leave. Just, it's really easy to deal with, spirit of depression. But, of course... We've become a woke nation, so we don't believe in the things of God. And so we have to have uh, psychologists and psychiatrists help people, and they usually mainly do it through drugs and not deliverance ministry. So God said there's more people, and this was 32 years ago, October 1991. There are more people in America today in need of deliverance than are in need of healing. So instead of truth and justice in the American way, we have now lies and injustice. We have lies and injustice. It's a shame, my brother and sister. I hate to see it. I hate to see what's happened to this country. It's being systematically looted by corrupt politicians. And this country, this nation needs Jesus. And they need the genuine church to rise up. Remember, we have authority. The Lord told me in 2014 in Williston, North Dakota, that the greatest attack against the church in the Bible was going to come in America. And we're seeing it. You know, if you're, you, you know, I know you've all seen it and read it. You know, where a teacher, or many teachers, are fired from their job because they have a Bible on their desk. How ridiculous, how crazy is that? How demonic is that? A Bible on their desk. Because, what does the Word say? This Word will not pass away. So they have to get rid of it. What's that a sign of? It's just like communist countries, isn't it? Or you try to go to a lot of Muslim nations. You know, we fought Gulf Wars. They wouldn't let our troops bring Bibles in. I'd have told them, hey, <laughs> protect yourself then. They're afraid of the word. China's afraid of the word. Communist Party, China. But this nation's under judgment because we don't, we're not living. 
were not fulfilling God's mandate any longer. What happens? What happens when that occurs? Whether you're a person, a church, a nation, God will give you over to a reprobate mind. Paul tells us that in Romans. He'll give you time to repent. But if you don't repent, like I've shared, Judah of old, you'll go into captivity. He judges by famine. He judges by war. You know, and I've said the last, you can go back and hear him years ago before the, before the, COVID thing. I said the the red the black horse is riding. That's pestilence. Then I said either last year or the year before, like, you know, I see the red for the year. I see the red horse. And it was like, well, it was February of that year. I, mean, I said this January first, I think it was February that that Russian Ukraine war broke out. So God judges by pestilence, by war by famine and by captivity. So if America doesn't repent, we're going to see boots on the ground here by foreign troops. Because that's the progression. He also uses wild animals we see in the Bible. That scripture I was reading earlier about the lions and leopards waiting, watching this to tear somebody apart. So we're under we're under judgment and we need to be like Nehemiah and repent for the sins of this nation and pray that that God will give us revelation on what to do and, and try to get as many people into the ark as we can because the end is near. And you can see it. We've talked about it many times. So be in prayer, my brother and sister, because America's had, I mean, God showed me back in 2010, you can read it, it was America's last call for repentance. And, and I don't believe as a nation that she'll ever repent. I think there can be pockets of revival like at Asbury where people will pay, are paying the price, have paid the price. But as a nation, it's going to be destroyed. But God will protect you, you know. There's never a time to be afraid. God fights our battles for us, even if they're against the establishment, as long as we're holy and righteous and living according to truth and justice. So let's be about the Father's business, which is truth and justice. You know, the Word of God says that justice is the foundation of his throne. God hates injustice. So let's be about the Father's business and let's be people of truth and honor and the American way. Let's do what we can to restore America to her senses. She can go back to the way she used to be, upholding truth and justice instead of obstructing truth and justice. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for this teaching, Lord. I thank you that you will use it to bless your people, Lord, and to make them understand your will for their life and how you wish to use them and in and, and these things, Lord, in these last days and the people that you can use them to intercede for and to pray over and to bless and to bring into the kingdom of God. And Father, I just thank you for your love and your faithfulness. And I thank you for blessing every person watching this, Lord, financially and spiritually. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Brother J.P. Timmons, www.ccipublishing.net. You can order our books and, and uh, help us uh, with the ministry there by buying books from us. That money goes into the work of the ministry. So you have a blessed week in Jesus' name. Amen.